At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. This afternoon, I, I am going to talk to you a, a little bit about my background, a little bit more about my background than you might see in the bio. Share with you the question that most people ask astronauts what it's like to travel in space. And at the same time, hopefully emphasize to you that you're in the right place, meaning that you're involved in STEM education, and that's the future. In fact, that's the now, and that's your future, and I'm glad to see you all here this morning, uh, this afternoon. As I stand here, I stand as a physician, I stand as a astronaut, and I stand as a venture capitalist. Anybody know what a venture capitalist does? A few, maybe? What does a venture capitalist do? What do you think? Exactly, invest money. So when I finished NASA, I went back to school and got an MBA and started working in the finance arena and the healthcare space. So what I do is I invest in companies that are uh, involved in telemedicine, which is uh, the new wave, the new future for medicine. This is where we apply technology to how healthcare is delivered. So I have done those three professions. Some people would be satisfied with just one of those, but not me, because I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I think it's been sa said earlier. I think it's important for all of us to do that. But more importantly, the only reason that I got a chance to do this is because of a dream. Every one of those, I saw my, I dreamed about it, and I saw myself being that astronaut, being that physician, and now being that venture capitalist, and I have some other things that, are, that I want to do. So when I was around 13 years old, I was fascinated with science and science fiction. And uh, one of the things that fascinated me the most was when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. And in the, you read about it in the history books. I got to watch it on the little black and white television, right? Anybody know what a black and white television is? OK. All right, a few people. All right. But what I saw on that was amazing to me because it opened my eyes to uh, a, a different world, uh, literally. And uh, every kid in my generation that watched the pictures of those guys land on the moon were fascinated. There's that, that shot. And uh, so I went running to my mother and I said, Mother, I know what I want to do in, you know, when I grow up. And why did I do that? Because my mother was an educator and she was always tasking me with, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? I said, heck, I'm only 13 years old. You know, give me some time. But I finally had something that I could tell her. And so I went to her and I said, Mother, I want to be an astronaut. And you know what she said to me? That's nice. <laughs> you know, when you get excited, you go to your parents about this thing and, and you kind of get this lukewarm response. That's kind of what I, what I got. But she followed with these words that I could be and do anything that I wanted to be and do in life. And if my mother said it, hey, it, it really was truth. And so I took her to heart. So I uh, decided that I would uh, research what, what being an astronaut was. Uh, of course, we didn't have the internet back in the day, so I went to the library. I read the newspapers and the magazines of, of the day. And that kind of set me on my course. I decided to become an astronaut, but on the way to becoming an astronaut, I actually, my first job was I played in a band called the Purple Haze. Look at this slide. Can you find me there? Yeah? I'm the guy with, the, with his hands on his hips in the uh, polyester shirt, double knit polyester pants. If you put a nat match up next to me, I'd probably go up in a flame because uh, it's all plastic. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, my afro is kind of lopsided. Why is it lopsided? Because there's an afro pick with a, with a hand like this, black power stuck in it right here. Anyway, I played professionally the tenor saxophone for, for about five years. And I show you this picture to, to emphasize, and I know many of you know that, and you're excited about being in science, some of you are as a geek as I am, but still you can have fun, right? And that's what I did in high school and part of college. Went on the University of Houston and eventually found my way to medical school and the rest is history, as they say. Why did I show this slide? Because I mentioned earlier that I was fascinated by science fiction. 
And one of the first people that I saw practicing space medicine was Bones of the Starship Enterprise. And I know many of you in your age probably don't know this Star Trek since the movie has come out with something different. But this is kind of interesting because it shows not only the, the medical doctor there, but it shows the technology that I'm involved in in telemedicine. Now, in the old show, when they took a patient, they would go into the sick bay and they would put him on the bed. And as soon as he got to the bed, you see that panel, display panel? It would show the vital signs. So we actually have a technology that we've invested in that actually does that. And you'll see in the hospitals in the future, you just go in, get in the bed, and automatically it will show your heart rate, your blood pressure, respiratory rate automatically. So it's, it's amazing to me how sometimes science fiction can predict science in a big way. If you also followed that show, you know that they came up with the first communication device. They had, came up with the first iPad. They came up with the first uh, PC, personal computer. All of that was predicted over 30, 40 years ago. I'm really giving my age now. But the first guy that actually went into space, who was a physician, physician, was a guy by the name of Joe Kerwin. And here he is examining one of his crew members. You notice something different about him? You notice something, yep, the patient's upside down. So if I'm a physician here in the, on the Earth, I would say, Mrs. Johnson, come in and have a seat on the table. In space, I'd just say, Joe, float this way and don't worry about up or down, because of course there's no up or down. And uh, so anyway, he was the real guy. And I followed his career. He became a flight surgeon. I became a flight surgeon. He became an astronaut. I became an astronaut. He flew on board Skylab for 28 days. I got a chance to fly into space uh, on two missions uh, and uh, spent a total of about uh, a month in space. But the reason I'm standing here is because of what this conference is all about, and that is STEM ed education. STEM education, particularly for me, medicine, was my launching pad uh, to the future. Uh, and you can see here, I'm showing, kind of showing you one of our posters. We do this program called the Dream Tour, where we go around the country. We've been here in Washington, D.C., too, where we try to get young people excited about math and science education. And so it's all about the STEM. So let's go into space real quickly. When astronauts are selected, we actually go into a room Usually it's about seven of us, and we decide on what the mission insignia is going to be, and that's that patch that you see on our flight suits. I understand that there were some astronauts here earlier rocking around in flight suits. And so this is a patch from my second mission where we went to the Mir space station. So you see the depiction of the uh, shuttle and the station Mir, which is a Russian station, on this patch. You'll see the American and Russian flag down below. And every mission has a mission number. The mission number for this this patch was 63, or this mission was 63. So look at this slide and see if you can find the symbol for six and three in it. And when you find it, just yell it out. Three stars and six rays of the sun, great. Well, you know that's all well and good, but you know the most important thing about this patch is it has my name on it right there, you see that? <laughs> So we need to make sure that we have evidence to show our family and friends that we actually did go into space. Now, all of you in this room probably know that we no longer fly the shuttle. When we did, though, it was an amazing vehicle. The thing weighs about five million pounds. In order to get that five million pounds in the air, we have to light five engines that produce a thrust of seven and a half million pounds. And I'm here to tell you today, when those babies light, you are leaving this planet and nothing's going to hold you to it. It's an incredible ride as you get it catapulted off the launch tower. This is an F-18 at about 40,000 feet looking down on the shuttle as we're coming through the clouds, and that was on, that was on our mission going on into orbit. So at this point, we're probably about 30 seconds into liftoff. At this point, we're only two minutes in the liftoff, and we're at an altitude of 100,000 feet. We call that first stage. At that point, we drop off the solid rocket motors. That's those on the right side. They fall back in the ocean and recover. And then we have the external tank and the shuttle that goes on the space. Now we are above most of the atmosphere, and there is nothing holding us back. You know when you're driving in the car with your parents and you roll down the window and you stick your hand out and you actually feel that resistance? That's what I'm talking about. So now, at 100,000 feet, if I could roll down the window of the shuttle and stick my hand out, I would hardly feel anything. So there's nothing holding us back. And at this point, we're going to mere 2,500 miles an hour. 
And over the next um, uh, six and a half minutes, we'll go from 2,500 miles an hour to 5,000 to 10,000, and eventually to 17,500 miles an hour. At that point, we go from being pushed back in our seat to three times our weight to zero gravity, just like that, and everything begins to float. It's an incredible feeling of relief once you get on orbit. Imagine what it would be like if we turned off gravity in this room right now. It would be kind of cool. We would float up to the ceiling. We would go from that side of the room to that side of the room, press with a little finger, and just kind of gliding across. The only problem is is about, I don't know, 200 of you in here. And so you would be bumping into each other and having a great time. But I guarantee you, within 10 minutes, you'll be telling me to put gravity back on so it can just get down. Once we're safely on orbit, we drop off the external tank. It falls back into the atmosphere, burns up on the way in. And then we have this nice view. And this is really the orientation that we are in space, upside down to the Earth, because that's where our overhead windows are, so we can look down at the Earth. And that's an incredible, incredible view as you look down. You can see the tail of the vehicle. You can see the Ohm's pods. Those are the main engines of the shuttle. You see the robotic arm there to the left. Here's my crew. This also shows you the types of suits that we fly up there. Our launch and entry suits, so the orange suits down below, they weigh 100, 120 pounds. The suits at the top are external, are, are EVA suits, uh, and that's uh, extra vehicular activity suits. That's what EVA stands for. And they weigh 350 pounds. Now, I know as you're looking at that, you're probably saying, Dr. Harris, you must be really strong. And of course, I would say to you, yes, I am. <laughs> In fact, I am like Superman. I'm going to prove it to you, all right? So not only am I standing in a suit on Earth that weighs 350 pounds, but when I did my spacewalk, I actually went outside and I lifted a satellite that weighed 3,000 pounds with these two hands. And I got to travel faster than a speeding bullet, 17,500 miles an hour, a little bit faster than a speeding bullet. And I think that meets the criteria. You might say, well, there's one left is that, you know, Superman's able to fly. Well, I flew too on the shuttle, I cheated a little bit. But is that Superman or what? What can I say? I want you to take a look at our faces and uh, look at my face. Look at Eileen Collins who is one of my favorite astronauts. She was the first female pilot and commander of a space shuttle mission. And watch what happens to us when we go from Earth into space. <laughs> we, I get a pointed head here, our eyes get a little puffy, and she gets an instant afro. You see that? <laughs> now, Janice Voss, who has long hair, if she didn't have her hair tied up, her hair would be standing on end, looking like Medusa. I guess I wouldn't say that in front of her. but. So all of you that have long hair, imagine what it would be like. I, I can tell you, as a male crew member, we do not like it when the women don't either cut their hair short or tie it up. I know that sounds kind of male chauvinistic, but it's, it's, it's real. You want to know why? Because when your hair is sticking out on end, it actually is like a um, prickly pear or like a porcupine. I mean, it just sticks straight out. And you bump into it if you, if you don't tie it up. So. The fluid shift is um, part of my job as a medical doctor. It's, uh, it's part of a condition called space adaptation syndrome. And this is when human be beings go into space, they adapt to that environment, zero gravity environment. And what happens is that we lose 1% of bone, we lose about 15 to 20% of our muscle mass. Uh, I have actually pretty big legs, but when I'm in space, when I come back, my legs are about that big. Chicken legs is what I would call it. We also, our heart shrinks inside. We lose about one-fifth of our blood volume while we're, while we're up there. And you can imagine when we come back down, it's hard for us to stand. We develop something called orthostatic intolerance. And so all of that is things that I get to um, evaluate in space and then come up with remedies for it. And here is some of the equipment that we use to evaluate folks in space. He's breathing through a mass spectrometer to look at pulmonary function tests. He's sitting on a bicycle logometer in order to do like exercise stress tests. In front of him is an echocardiogram where we'll look inside the heart. And we also have microscopes and we have other devices that we use up there. Here I am examining one of our crew members. And uh, I was lucky enough to be the first physician to do a physical examination in space where I examined my other crew members. And I also did the first telemedicine conference, meaning that 
We filmed that examination. We sent it down to uh, medical center here, the Mayo Clinic, and I actually did a lecture from space to the medical students and, and grad students that were there. That was kind of fun. So just a couple of pictures of what it's like to look out the window. This is a um, storm, massive storm typhoon over the uh, southern Pacific. This is a thunderstorm over Houston, Texas. We get a lot of these, that's where I live. This is a massive dust storm coming off the Sahara Desert, and that dust will actually travel up to around 40 to 50,000 feet, go completely over the Atlantic Ocean and dump here in the Americas. And so when you talk about you know, climate change and how one part of the region can affect another, we can see it real time in space. This is uh, what we call the Terminator. We have nighttime on one side and daytime on the other side at the same time, which is kind of cool. And here is Northern Lights, really fascinating. One night um, on my second flight, we were traveling in a high inclination orbit, around 52 degrees latitude. And so we got a chance to pass over, um, um, this was over Canada. And in the distance, probably, I don't know, some 500 miles away, I saw these lights just kind of on the horizon. I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe I was going to be the first astronaut to discover a UFO. I mean, seriously, that was in my head. I was going like, OK, this could be it. As we got closer, though, that little spot got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that when we arrived, this whole northern lights, the, the energized particles were uh, completely around the vehicle. It was incredible. It went up as high as I could, you know, in, into the space as I could see and all the way down to Earth. It was just the most beautiful sight that you would ever see. This is um, a sunrise uh, from space. So this is the Earth down below. That dark area are clouds at about 50,000 feet. You can see kind of different layers of the atmosphere. And unfortunately, our cameras cannot capture the detail that our eyes see when we're in orbit. And so you don't see the distinct layers. Right here is kind of uh, fuzzy. But in space, you can actually see them, almost like draw line for line and, and be able to name them. This is the International Station, just to remind you that above us at 250 miles, going around at 17,500 miles an hour, are seven or eight crew members that are there 24-7 doing kind of fun stuff that I got to do on the shuttle, but doing it uh, 365 days a year. Hopefully that will lead us going back to the moon, and this time not to just plant our feet in the sand and say we'll be there and plant a flag, but to actually have habitat modules. And This was actually my dream. When I would daydream about going into space, it was to be able to get outside of one of these vehicles and hang my shingle Bernard Harris MD on it, which would be kind of cool. So I don't know if I'll get a chance to do that, but maybe one of you might. Hopefully it'll lead us to Mars, and Mars will be somewhat challenging. And then lastly, I'm going to end, uh, just talk a little bit about, we do a lot of stuff around education at the Harris Foundation. Not only do I do venture capital, but I also give back and education programs. These are some of our programs. Now, we run the largest summer science camp in the country, and I don't know where you're from, but uh, if you go to our website, you can check to see, but it's a summer science camp for middle school kids where you actually spend two weeks on a college campus, and you get um, project-based learning, in, uh, interactive learning, it's really fun. So, repeat after me. I'm an infinite being, with infinite possibilities. Now, let me uh, reflect back to you how that sounded. It sounded like this. I'm an infinite being with infinite possibility. Oh, God, is he going to ask me to say it again? <laughs> Guess what? I'm going to ask you to say it again, but give me a little bit more, if you would. I'm an infinite being, I'm an infinite being. With, infinite possibilities. with infinite possibilities. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means, number one, that each and every one of you in this room was born multipotential, meaning you have the ability to do anything that you want to do in life, anything, it's up to you. Number two, it means that you were born multi-talented, meaning that we're all born with certain abilities and certain skills that are uniquely ours. You ever wonder why you like to play basketball or why you like music or why you like math or why you like science and there may be no rhyme or reason to it because you were born with that ability. You can also use something called a brain and learn 
different skills, additional skills, so use it. Again, it's up to you. And number three, and lastly, you were born for a reason. There's a reason that you are here, to share your talents, not only with yourself, but with the rest of the world. And hearing the questions that, you know, from the, the previous speaker, I cannot wait to see what you guys have to offer the world. Thank you very much.